it uh, is about 12.05, so I think probably now is a good time to get started. Um, welcome and thank you for calling in. My name is Morgan Lamb. I'm a internist, nephrologist, and palliative care specialist, uh, a bit of a roaming nephrologist throughout the, the province, um, and you'll find me in several health authorities at uh, any given time. Um, it seems like, from what I've been told, one of the areas of uh, interest was looking at electrolyte disturbances. Uh, and so I've tried to craft this presentation to be uh, practical and hopefully useful with a bit of uh, touch of physiology. Um, uh, hopefully not bore you too much. Um, I have been told that you should be able to ask questions in the chat uh, in the bottom and you can change it so that only I'm only the questions directed to me. So please feel free to do that throughout uh, and I'll try to keep an eye out. And of course you can send me any uh, questions or feedback to my email um, uh, if you think of it after. I don't have any uh, disclosures um, and no conflicts of interest. The only um, caveat to this is it is my first time using GoToWebinar, so if we experience any IT difficulties, I apologize in advance, but hopefully not. So hopefully what we're hoping to accomplish today is to take a look at some of the common laboratory abnormalities that you might see in your practice. Um, primarily as an outpatient approach, uh, on an outpatient basis, and then look at uh, approaches to managing some of these abnormalities. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uremia, as I've had this question in the past about what that actually represents, uh, when it, you might want to think about a nephrology referral. And then it's hard to really uh, leave fluid and electrolytes without talking uh, and thinking about diuretics and how we use them. And that always leads me to talk a little bit about the concept of renal autoregulation, which hopefully you'll find useful in your practice as well. So let's start with hypernatremia. Um, I find that conceptually this is one of the easiest uh, things to start with just to get our minds tuned into what the actual problem is. So hypernatremia is uh, defined as a serum sodium greater than 145 millimoles per liter. And basically, it reflects a reduction of, um, or, or reflects cellular dehydration and a reduction of free water relative to solute. This oftentimes comes in the form of uh, your daily losses. So we all know that we lose water from breathing, sweating, GI, and GU losses. And on a, it sort of ranges on the order of half a liter to a liter um, that that you would have in terms of your insensible losses, not accounting for the water that you actually make from um, your daily metabolic needs. And the most common cause of hypernatremia really comes down to these three things, which is free water loss, um, a deficit in pure free water intake, or more rarely, sodium overload and ingestion. I apologize there. Um, with respect to free water losses, the way to best think about this is looking at it from a uh, renal concentration deficit. And so this oftentimes can come in the form of an osmotic diuresis. And what that is typically referring to is uncontrolled diabetes. So you have glucosuria, which is pulling water uh, out in the urine uh, along with uh, the glucose. Uh, it can also be in the form of diabetes insipidus, where individuals have uncontrolled loss of free water. And in some of our um, patients who are on loop diuretics, usually loop more than thiazide when you see hypernatremia. It can also come in the sense of uh, GI losses with respect to diarrhea. Uh, and in patients who are afflicted with uh, burns, uh, even minor burns, but affecting a large uh, total body surface area, they can have increase in sensible losses. Um, similarly, anything that increases your metabolism or your temperature will also increase your insensible losses. And of course, the solution to this is to give free water. Uh, and, to, and to think about stopping that diuretic, I, and I say think about this in that 
Remember, diuretics are misnomers. They're actually naturetics. They remove sodium and water follows as a result. So for example, many patients are on either thiazides for the control of hypertension or loop diuretics for the control of, say, CHF. In the latter population, what you want to think about is you may still need to remove net sodium. And so actually the solution there is not necessarily to stop the diuretic, but to supplement with free water so that you can continue to remove the sodium without having that uh, side effect. When we start to think about some more interesting entities like diabetes insipidus, this is where you may look at a urine osmolality versus a serum osmolality. And basically this is pretty much saying that the patients are producing dilute urine as opposed to concentrated urine. This could also represent an intake deficit where patients for whatever reason are unable to respond to their natural thirst mechanisms. Now by and large, this is not gonna be the case for uh, many outpatients, but we do see this in our hospitalized patients. And if you see this in some of the blood work that you're getting CC'd on uh, an admitted patient, this might make a little more sense. Inevitably, our thirst mechanisms are extremely powerful. And so as our serum sodium rises, the natural tendency will be to reach for water. Now you can imagine if you're admitted um, and say you're critically ill in the ICU even, you can't respond to your thirst mechanism. Similarly, if you are somebody with um, uh, psychogenic polydipsia um, and you're removed from a free water source, you won't be able to respond to uh, your thirst mechanisms, or sorry, with uh, central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. You won't be able to respond to your thirst mechanism and you will not be able to intake that free water in order to lower your serum sodium. And oftentimes the reason you don't see this as an outpatient is because um, for those of us who have access to free water, it is a very powerful driver and we actually are able to replace um, the extensive losses through the urine uh, by just drinking to thirst. And finally, it comes to the, the third etiology, which is sodium overload. Uh, oftentimes, this is iatrogenic, either by use of hypertonic saline, salt tablets. Um, occasionally, you have individuals who ingest salt water, but um, as evidenced by the photo here, they oftentimes don't know any better. Uh, and of course, there are some pathological conditions such as primary hyperaldosteronism or Cushing syndrome that can also cause hypernitremia by essentially causing the kidney to absorb sodium and not listen to its own feedback mechanisms. Practically speaking, um, when I see hyponatremia, or hypernatremia, sorry, this is most often seen in a post-ATN or an obstructive diuresis phase. And although you may see this less in the outpatient setting, it is somewhat possible that uh, you could have a patient who presents with an obstructive neuropathy, receives a Foley catheter, and then starts to diurese uh, by having a relatively uncontrolled uh, polyuria. And that is because in the recovery phase of both of these entities, you get quite a bit of urine production, which is primarily a loss of water. And biochemically, as a response, you see the serum sodium rise. You could also see this when patients are being aggressively uh, diuresed in hospital. These are, are patients who are extremely volume overloaded and oftentimes on IV furosemide. Similarly, in the critical illness uh, population, these are all sort of more iatrogenic based uh, hypernatremias uh, because we are altering renal physiology. The one sort of more normal caveat to all of this is that Hypernatremia at the end of life or during a terminal course is actually very normal. Um, and it does re reflect the fact that the patients are no longer 
either responding to their thirst or they're not able to um, sense uh, that they're thirsty. Um, and I put this little pro tip in because there are ways to calculate the free water deficit or free water excess in any given patient of any given size. It does assume that your patient is a bathtub, which uh, is not the case with many of our patients. However, it does sort of give you an idea of the magnitude uh, of free water uh, deficit in any given situation. So the rule of thumb, and this does work if you want to check with the equations afterwards, is that for a 70 kilogram male, every 10 mole mil millimole per liter increase in sodium responds to approximately a three liter free water deficit. Now remember, this is them as a bathtub. This assumes they don't make urine. This assumes nothing else is happening. But what it does tell you is that that patient probably has to ingest quite a bit of extra free water on top of uh, everything else that is going on in order to get them back down to a more normal so sodium. And this brings us naturally to hyponatremia, now that we've sort of talked about the role of water. Uh, this is probably the most common electrolyte problem. Um, and the reason we worry about hyponatremia is because if it becomes severe, it can lead to cerebral edema. Um, in, in a more chronic state, it is associated with increased risk of falls and osteoporosis, which you can imagine in our little old ladies on thiazide diuretics is really the wrong combination of uh, things to happen. When we think about cerebral edema, I separated the symptoms into sort of two categories, the more minor symptoms, um, which you start to see when the sodium starts to fall into the mid-120s. It consists of vague things like nausea, confusion, some headache. For whatever reason, there seems to be an increased um, uh, frequency of yawning and lethargy. And then the more severe neurological symptoms, which when you start to see these, this would actually prompt more acute management. And this would include vomiting, uh, ataxia, disorientation or psychosis, and when it becomes very severe, seizures and coma. These are the patients where you may refer on to um, uh, hospital-based care in order to get their sodium more acutely managed, uh, whereas the others you could probably do as an outpatient with follow-up blood work. And the question is always clinically, how, how do you think about sodium? And so my rule is if they are hyponatremic and they are symptomatic with some of the more severe neurological symptoms or even um, less severe but persistent uh, mild symptoms that they should be referred for acute care management. And if they're asymptomatic, that's when you sort of have time to think uh, and, and stop uh, to figure out exactly what's going on. The traditional thinking in terms of um, hyponatremia is that if it is acute, um, the correction can be more acute. Now, practically speaking, in your practice, the most likely hyponatremia that you will run into is on a more chronic basis. And over time, the brain adapts to hyponatremia by um, shedding uh, osmolites. And it does this to reduce that sort of brain swelling so that the water doesn't just want to go into the brain cells, but actually will normalize um, uh, in response over time. And when you think about hyponatremia, um, I've refrained from getting too far into the physiology, but the two things that have to be present by and large are water and antidiuretic hormone or ADH. And your first steps in terms of management is simply to restrict free water. That is by and large the safest thing to do and what will work in any scenario. And oftentimes to look at their medications to see if there's something as simple as thiazide medications 
which actually interfere with the formation of dilute urine. So if you think about what that's actually doing, this thiazide medication, it does not allow the patient to get rid of that free water that they're holding on to, um, proportionate to the amount of salt that's being removed. Water comes in the form of endogenous water that is produced in um, aerobic metabolism, and then exogenous water, so typically fluid intake uh, and IV fluids and IV medications that can uh, contain water or primarily water. ADH is a little trickier of a hormone. Um, it first responds to changes in osmolality as small as 1% to 2%. And you can imagine this is important because really the, the role is to prevent the brain from swelling and, and shrinking when we all drink water on a daily basis. So it turns on and off very quickly um, in response to very small changes in serum osmolality. There's also non-osmotic stimuli. So um, one of these is decreased effective circulating volume. So for those patients with heart failure, cirrhosis, or GI losses, and this is mediated by a parasympathetic stimulus for ADH release, which sort of overrides um, our natural mechanisms. On top of this, I have I have what we call physiologic stress states. So nausea, pain, uh, post-operative states, pregnancy, these can cause non-osmotic stimuli of ADH that I would not necessarily term a syndrome of inappropriate ADH since that category is in response to sort of a more um, pathological state, uh, often caused by uh, pulmonary or intracranial processes or uh, the humoral production of ADH by um, uh, certain types of malignancies. And finally, one of the non-osmotic stimuli that does sometimes become clinically quite relevant in your population is hypovolemia. Now, this is something that does not respond as quickly as the response to serum osmolality. So typically, you do actually need a much larger decrease, about 7 to 10% in your blood volume before you see ADH kick in. And it's in these patients where you typically, on a clinical history, you do have that history of diarrhea or vomiting or uh, poor intake and a continuation of the diuretic, where you do get a sense that they are becoming intravascularly deplete. Some of the first tests that you might do as an outpatient would be, number one, to repeat the um, uh, serum electrolytes, uh, but add a urea uh, and a creatinine as well as a glucose. This will allow you to calculate your serum osmolality uh, by virtue of the sodium, the glucose, and the BUN. And that will give you an idea of where the serum osmolality is sitting with respect to the urine osmolality. We can talk about that in the next little bit. I also like to uh, test the urine for a sodium and a chloride. Now, the caveat to this is that thiazide that, um, diuretics, or any diuretics for that example, will interfere uh, with this test. So they typically have to be off their diuretic medication if you want to be able to interpret this properly. Otherwise, if the diuretic is doing its job, you should actually have a uh, normal to high uh, urine sodium, regardless of what is happening physiologically. And a urinalysis for specific gravity. And remember, while you're doing this, the most, uh, the safest thing to do is to ask the patient to limit their uh, free water intake. And to be clear, free water is in reference to most of the things that you would drink uh, as an outpatient basis, aside from, say, uh, uh, a heavier soup or anything, uh, a soup out of a can, uh, which is oftentimes loaded with sodium, but teas, coffee, sports drinks, all of those things are predominantly water, um, and we don't necessarily associate that um, with those in our minds. <clears throat> 
here's another little trick of the trade. Um, you could use the urine specific gravity as a surrogate marker for the urine osmolality um, in case you don't have one. Um, a specific gravity of one uh, is fairly dilute urine. And it's not until you get to a specific gravity of 1.01 where you start to think this is becoming more concentrated urine. The cutoff in my mind that I use for the stimulus for ADH is around 300 to 350 uh, milliosms, which fortunately corresponds to the specific gravity of uh, 1.01 or slightly above that quite well. Now, interpreting the tests can become a little bit more nuanced, but hopefully we'll talk about just a couple uh, things. When you're looking at the osmolality of the urine, what you're trying to figure out and what the important thing to remember is, is your patient making concentrated urine? If they are making concentrated urine, really the only way of them doing that is for them to be secreting on some level somewhere due to some stimulus some antidiuretic hormone. Remember, it, the function of the hormone is to produce quote unquote antidiuresis. And what it does is it allows the, the distal collecting duct to reabsorb water, and that makes concentrated urine. Conversely, if you have a low urine osmolality, it tells you that your patient is actually making dilute urine which suggests that that particular hormone is not having as much of an effect. We can talk about that in just a, a little while. Which leads us to the next step, looking at the urine sodium and the urine chloride. Now, typically when these are under 20, it suggests that for whatever reason, at the level of the kidney, the kidney believes that it is not getting enough perfusion. And as a response to that, it is causing sodium reabsorption. Now, if that is the case, it actually tells you that the etiology of your hyponatremia is due to the fact that the kidney thinks it's not being perfused. And this can be seen in what we would traditionally consider quote-unquote pre-renal. You could be truly hypovolemic, so intravascularly deplete, or you could be on the opposite side of that curve where you're actually in heart failure um, or you have uh, cirrhosis uh, and hepatic failure or uh, nephrotic range uh, proteinuria where it's sort of a mix uh, of volume overload and uh, intravascular depletion. When you look at some of the other things that can come out from this, when you have a low solute diet, very typically those patients can have uh, a little bit of ADH uh, or none at all. So in many, re in many uh, scenarios, you actually have those patients making relatively dilute urine uh, and who also have uh, potentially low or normal urine sodiums. And that's sort of a clue uh, to do a dietary review to see exactly how much solute and how much salt is being uh, taken in on a daily basis. And they typically have a fairly bland diet. So this is the same as your tea and toaster, uh, little old ladies or men, um, and your beer potomania where the predominant ingestion is solute-free substances. Common things being common, and what you typically see is that thiazide diuretics are the reason for the hyponatremia. And in many of these patients, uh, I would conclude that that is a relative intolerance to that medication. So the be-all and end-all is when you see that there's a problem with the sodium, I want you to think about water and how that plays into it because predominantly it is a water problem. Now, some of the other uh, electrolyte challenges that you typically run into will be hyperkalemia, uh, which is sort of uh, 
a tricky electrolyte that we often see in our renal population and occasionally you see in non-renal populations. Um, now, hyperkalemia is really on the balance of intake and excretion, simply put. Most of the potassium in the body is renally excreted, so 90 to 95%. However, there is some uh, GI excretion between 5 and 10%. And typically what you see uh, in terms of your hyperkalemia is somebody who may have stage 3 CKD, whose GFR is not overtly impaired, but who does occasionally become hyperkalemic. And so this is where a good medication review will be your friend. Potassium sparing diuretics such as spironolactone uh, and other uh, antibiotics like Septra that interfere with potassium excretion um, might explain why your patient has become transiently hyperkalemic. And I have found that oftentimes uh, many of these patients, because their renal function is not completely normal, that balance between renal and GI excretion has actually shifted. So the potassium that they get rid of uh, actually does depend on what their GI status is. And it doesn't take too much constipation to have poor potassium elimination and arguably increased potassium absorption from the gut due to increased um, uh, time. Now, you probably have uh, been well aware that there's uh, potassium-based GI binders, such as po sodium polystyrene and calcium polystyrene, um, that help to decrease uh, the serum potassium by virtue of binding and optimizing GI elimination. And these can typically be done um, uh, as an outpatient basis, and certainly we use them as a, a, a backup plan for many of our patients who uh, have declining renal function. There are also some newer agents which have been uh, recently approved, such as uh, um which I believe was approved by Health Canada just last fall, and then sodium zirconium, which is another uh, new potassium-based GI binder. Uh, that is not yet available in Canada. So these will be coming, I think, to market soon. Our experience of them, with them, sorry, because of uh, only recent approval is quite limited. Uh, and uh, the, the primary marketing around them is that they're more well tolerated by patients. Um, it is true that sodium polystyrene or K-exalate, uh, as it is known, is uh, not necessarily the most well-tolerated, but by and large, um, patients do and can take it. The other uh, easy thing to do is to tell your patients to decrease their potassium-rich foods until their renal and, and GI systems are uh, a little bit more normal. And either, this is a quick review of um, high potassium foods that typically cause problems. Uh, tomatoes, and um, you oftentimes see patients tell you that they had a nice tomato soup or tomato-based soup or a pasta. Uh, potatoes, and you find patients snacking on chips, that counts as well. Uh, fruits, including bananas, oranges, and watermelon. Banana ha has been sort of given the, the um, poster child of being the potassium uh, bad food, but it has the secondary characteristic of also being quite constipating. So it's sort of a two-in-one uh, entity when it comes to that. And then some of your greens, uh, such as spinach, broccoli, and beans are high in potassium and not to be forgotten in this era of uh, avocado and toast, um, uh, the avocados that um, are making Vancouver real estate unaffordable. Finally, um, the final quote-unquote electrolyte that I wanted to talk about a little bit is urea. Now, urea by and of itself is actually not a toxic entity, uh, but we do use it in nephrology as a surrogate measure of renal function and clearance. But I guess the thing to caution is that a high urea does not necessarily equal uremia. Uremia is 
and how we use this term is um, related to symptoms associated with this toxic metabolic accumulation that you see in renal impairment. And this comes down to mental status changes uh, in your patients um, uh, that can manifest as uh, fatigue or mood changes anorexia, oftentimes there's taste changes and they report sort of a metallic taste, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, uh, itch, restless legs and cramps can all sort of give us this uh, semblance of uh, a more uremic state. And that sort of leads us to when we would consider uh, dialysis. Now, um, this is, of course, something that is difficult to cover in uh, a single hour. Um, we spend many years sort of training to, to determine the nuances of this. But this is sort of a quick glance and overview of where you may have a patient who may need more acute care. So when we take a, take a look at the acute indications for dialysis, this is usually uh, when it comes to something that is refractory or medically refractory. And that is, I think, the key to take home here. Many patients who are sent to the hospital with uh, acute renal injuries or electrolyte disturbances don't immediately get dialyzed. In fact, we often um, try our hand at medical stabilization over the first uh, hours and days. Um, and it's because in many situations, you can sort of uh, turn the corner, so to speak, by doing this. But some of the things that we look for are threatening electrolyte disturbances, specifically the hyperkalemia, stabilization of the acid-base status, especially in the setting of progressive acidosis, managing volume, um, so patients who are not peeing basically accrue uh, their daily intake and they're unable to get rid of it any dialyzable intoxications, and this sort of uremic entity that we just spoke of. However, the take-home points here, I think, are the red flags. So when you have patients who present with any sort of electrolyte difficulties um, who tell you that they're not peeing, I think that is certainly an indication to send them uh, into the acute care system because that, by and large, um, could potentially become a problem if that persists. Um, and sometimes the placement of a Foley in something simple could relieve that, but that is not something that uh, I would expect is done in the outpatient setting in your office per se. And it's sort of unreasonable to expect that uh, you would have the capacity to, and, and time to deal with this in your offices uh, being as busy as they are. Of course, the other um, red flag is any sort of end organ impairment. So when you start to see neurological changes, respiratory or cardiac uh, effects on your patients and you think it's because of these electrolyte or um, renal impairment difficulties, then these are all signs where you can be safely assured that an escalation of care is completely appropriate. As to when to call nephrology, you know, I think that whenever you're not sure when you're worried about a patient is uh, more than enough reason, and um, from my perspective at least, I'm more than happy to talk to uh, anybody, even if you just want to run by uh, a quick question about um, an electrolyte disturbance to ensure that your your um, management plan is, um, you know, appropriate and that you're not missing anything. Uh, and of course, sort of the, the thought about electrolytes and whatnot always leads to considerations of medications. Now, I'd like to plant the seed that um, this, by and large, uh, is one of the biggest um, principles that you can fall back on when looking at outpatient medication management. And it comes down to pretty much exactly how GFR is determined which is the hydrostatic pressure um, on the glomerular capillary side. Hopefully you can see the little pointer here. That is generated by the efferent and afferent arterial and causing a filtration into the lumen. Now, 
all of this is uh, mediated by what I call or what is known as renal autoregulation. So despite changes in systemic blood pressure or perfusion, the kidney inherently has its own system to maintain GFR regardless of these changes. One of them is by constriction of the efferent arterial, and one of them is by dilation of the afferent arterial. Now, as you can imagine, when we use medications to change the physiologic state of our patients, such as ACE inhibitors, you lose the ability to do this. And similarly, for patients who are on NSAIDs or who choose to take NSAIDs, you lose the ability of the prostaglandins to vasodilate the afferent arterial. And so what is happening there is you are now impairing the kidney's ability to regulate its own perfusion. And the analogy that I oftentimes use with patients is that imagine if you had one hand tied behind your back and then a second hand tied behind your back and then I push and trip you, the cases that you're the probability that you're going to fall and hurt your face becomes much higher when both hands are missing. And this may sometimes explain why it doesn't take too much for our patients to develop quite a uh, large renal insult when they are already on maintenance ACE inhibitors. Now these medications are quite good uh, for many different reasons, but in the setting of an additional insult, it becomes this sort of trifecta uh, where the kidney really cannot adapt to that extra insult. And so just looking at the population of patients who are on both ACE inhibitors or ARBs and diuretics, um, that in and of itself is the perfect storm for one last little thing uh, to cause these patients to have uh, significant kidney impairment. Which leads me to the, the thought of a, a sick day plan, and this is what all patients should be told about, not necessarily just diuretics and ACE inhibitors, but other medications that are uh, perhaps renally excreted, such as metformin. And the thought is that if you have, if you're having a quote-unquote sick day, or you're having the flu, and you're, perhaps your intake's not quite normal, you're having a diarrhea that is... Um, causing you to not be able to keep up with your losses, that it's actually okay to hold uh, your ACE inhibitors and your diuretics uh, by virtue of the fact that um, holding them for a few days until you get a bit more normal uh, is actually probably in your best interest. And I guess the last thing to talk about now is looking at a little bit more um, at your CHF population uh, in, with respect to CKD and the trade-offs that we might have to look at taking. <clears throat> and these are some of the principles um, in CHF management. And I, I have here focus on the goal because there's a lot of different things that can be going on uh, when we're looking at using diuretics uh, in uh, CHF. The first of, uh, of this is looking at the effective diuretic dose. Now, typically we're talking about the use of furosemide, and this is confounded by GFR uh, as well as albumin. We know that furosemide is bound to albumin, and so it is, it is thought of as being delivered to the kidney uh, bound to albumin. So if patients have a low albumin state, they actually may need a higher dose of furosemide. It is also correlated with a patient's GFR. Now, furosemide is secreted in the proximal tubule, but functionally speaking, you can think of the more renal impairment a patient has, the bigger the dose uh, of furosemide that they might need. And the way to determine this is um, basically the dose that produces a prompt urinary, urinary response within one to two hours of administration. And that can vary for a lot of different patients based on GI absorption and their renal function. So first, find the most effective diuretic dose for your patient, I think is the first step. 
and know that the, the fear around furosemide causing an acute kidney injury um, is a bit of a misnomer because by itself it does not actually cause uh, AKI or hypotension. It only does this if it is accompanied by intravascular depre depletion. And so therefore, foreseeably, if you gave a patient a dose of furosemide and they actually did not make any more urine than they normally would, there would be no associated AKI. Now, in principle, what you're actually trying to do when you're diuresing your patients, is you actually want to produce a little bit of a shift in their intravascular volume so that they re-recruit some of that extravascular fluid. And so you do, in some ways, expect that they should have some degree of change in their renal perfusion. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll see an elevation of creatinine because if they autoregulate, their glomerular perfusion stays the same. However, if they don't autoregulate or if they're already autoregulating to their maximal ability and they become a little bit intravascularly deplete, then you may see an elevation in creatinine. You also get patients who, in their CHF state, have um, effusions. And so the first step and the, the least invasive thing is to try to diurese these off. Now, the one thing you have to realize is that the re-recruitment of these effusions takes uh, time. And so if patients are actually acutely symptomatic, the fastest thing to do to release that is actually a therapeutic drainage. Uh, otherwise, the resolution of these effusions can be in the order of weeks um, with effective diuresis. So that's the one uh, caveat is that even with very invasive modalities like dialysis, removal of an effusion represents fluid that is in a different body compartment from what we are used to accessing, which is the intravascular body compartment. Now, over time, what you're trying to do with the diuretic is you're actually trying to cause a bit of intravascular depletion and allow for what I call refill. And remember, the goal is really an improvement in symptoms. So some sort of change in ambulation distance or sopnia, sleep, cough, tiredness. And you want to have some sort of way, if possible, to objectively verify this by either weight, changes in waist or leg circumference, or O2 requirements in admitted patients. And remember, aim for progress and not perfection. There's no, there's no urgency or need to try to get several kilograms of fluid off your patient in a very short course. If you get, get half a kilo to a kilogram decrease per day, that is actually plenty. And it speaks to the fact that as you get closer to their true dry weight, they will take more time for them, for them to refill their intravascular space so that you could continue diuresing them. So foreseeably, for example, you might be diuresing someone on a daily basis to start and then find that as they approach their true dry weight and they become more euvolemic, you may actually use every second day dosing uh, frosamide. And that is completely fine. Um, I think that's the, the place where uh, a lot of ongoing clinical reassessment um, is going to be your friend. So I think the take-home messages from this talk is when you see a sodium problem, think water. Um, maintain your trust that the kidneys were really built to take care of themselves. However, oftentimes in medicine, we change their physiology such that they're unable to do so. And that leads to really the education around a medication sick day plan. Never be afraid to reassess diuretic use and realize that sometimes, sometimes you do need twice a day diuresis and sometimes you need every two or every three day uh, diuretic use. And all of that is fine as long as you're able to maintain your symptoms under control. And finally, you will sometimes need to sacrifice GFR for volume status, and that is okay because it comes down to the, the goal of 
uh, mitigating uh, a patient's symptoms. And with that, that's all I have uh, so far. And I open up to any questions that you might have. Uh, I can read them out and, and then answer them. So we do have a question, uh, and it is, at what potassium do you use KX lead? Now, the interesting thing about serum potassium measurements is that um, there are different levels of comfort with uh, what constitutes a unstable or dangerous potassium. And unfortunately, it also is very patient-specific. Now, I think that um, borderline hyperkalemia uh, as defined by a potassium between 5 and 5.5, you could probably ask that patient to review what is happening clinically, um, get them to decrease their potassium-rich foods, maybe stop their medications, and then repeat that blood work in a few days and get away with not using any potassium-based binders. Anything above that, you start to get into a level of uh, slight discomfort because you know that there's not too much reserve uh, before those particular patients could foreseeably get in trouble. Now, there's no absolute serum potassium where you would say you absolutely have to treat um, with uh, acute reversal, and that is because many patients tolerate a different level of potassium. I do think that the general consensus for your outpatients who are not uh, chronic kidney disease patients uh, would be anything above about 5.5, between 5.5 and 6, you would start to think about using your potassium-based binders to cause uh, a decrease in that potassium. And um, in terms of dosing, you may use 30 grams of sodium polystyrene if you would like to have quite a large effect, or 15 grams is something that would be considered a mild to moderate effect. For a lot of our chronic kidney disease patients who are more used to hyperkalemia, you may get blood work that, for example, you're copied on from our kidney care centers that show that their potassium oftentimes drifts between 5.5 and um, 5.7, and those are patients who are sometimes on a more regular dose of kaxalate in order to mitigate against this. And generally, the the patients who tolerate the higher potassiums are the patients who have a chronicity associated with it. So you, if you have somebody who, for example, has become acutely obstructed, has never really become hypernatremic or sorry, hyperkalemic in their life, um, you may worry a little bit more about that person if their potassium has gone up even to 5.5. Now, a dialysis patient, uh, especially hemodialysis patient who typically come in with pre-dialysis potassiums anywhere between 5.5, 6, some even uh, above 6, um, oftentimes are relatively asymptomatic. And so it is very context-specific in terms of when you interpret your blood work. Um, but by and large, I think if you need to buy yourself a bit of time to sort out exactly what's causing the hyperkalemia, reaching for kx is not uh, a bad idea. Uh, I'm going to try to make this little question screen a little bit bigger. I'm not sure why it's so tiny. Um, okay. So one of the questions is, are hypokalemic patients also oftentimes hyponatremic? That's part one of the question. Um, sometimes they are. And we didn't really get into this, but in terms of how you think about correcting them, um, you would take into account the degree of hypokalemia in acute correction so that you don't overcorrect them. Um, now, by and large, when you think about sodium and potassium and how they cause fluid shifts, you would lump them together in your mind. So um, 
a correction of hypokalemia and a correction of hyponatremia together would mitigate against um, fluid shifts um, and cerebral edema. The second part of that, and to be very honest with you, for patients who are severely hyponatremic uh, and hypokalemic, um, we oftentimes do sort of replace potassium first uh, and then focus on slow correction of the sodium to sort of control things a little bit more. Uh, the second part of that question is, can you comment on the link between potassium and magnesium and when we should screen for the latter? Uh, we didn't quite get into this, but in individuals who are hypokalemic, one of the things that can cause persistent hypokalemia is actually a low uh, magnesium. Now, the difficulty thing with uh, hypomagnesemia is that what we measure in the serum does not reflect uh, what is present intracellularly. So we use it as a surrogate marker that if a serum magnesium is low, foreseeably the intracellular magnesium is also low. And in the distal sort of tubule, magnesium plays a role in uh, the sort of reabsorption of uh, potassium. And that's why replacing magnesium would be important in patients who are uh, persistently hypokalemic. The next question is, oh, and, and sorry, and the, I guess the specific answer for when you should screen for hypomagnesemia is in the setting of someone who is hypokalemic, who you've replaced their potassium either medically or from a dietary source, who continues to be uh, hypokalemic. And then you would think, is there an underlying hypomagnesemia which is precipitating or propagating this um, uh, cause. Um, the next question is, is CEPTRA okay for an older patient who is on an ACE inhibitor with normal renal function, or should we still avoid CEPTRA in this population? Um, CEPTRA is uh, a completely uh, safe antibiotic um, in the setting of normal renal function knowing that oftentimes when you start septra, it can cause what I call a fake kidney injury in that it prevents the secretion of creatinine. So you may see an elevation in your serum creatinine that would mimic a kidney injury, but it is actually not a true kidney injury in that your glomerular perfusion has not changed. The reason that septra is oftentimes held or stopped in the setting of a kidney injury is it prevents or impairs our ability to assess the evolution of that kidney injury. So you may see consults from um, hospitals uh, where patients come in with an AKI and then their septa is held and it's part and parcel because it interferes with our interpretation of the creatinine kinetics that will happen over the next few days. Uh, the follow-up question is, would septra still cause hyperkalemia uh, in that population? And certainly it very well could. Um, it certainly depends on how much uh, the, the patient is relying on their renal excretion of potassium um, with respect to what septra actually is inhibiting. But I think if you had a patient with normal renal function on an ACE inhibitor, I would say that it would not preclude them from starting septra, knowing that you would have to look for these electrolyte abnormalities. And I think that is about time. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, hopefully it was helpful. Uh, I did sort of purposely omit um, electrolytes such as calcium and phosphate, which I thought probably would be less useful in your practice. Uh, 
uh, but certainly give me feedback in case um, we can make changes for the future. And um, uh, thank you for calling in.